Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Roy Christian Church. Coming through loud and clear here, maybe not so much where you are. <clears throat> Thank you for being here today. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you uh, both here in the house uh, and also uh, joining us um, from uh, somewhere else in the world, wherever that may be. Um, we're, uh, we're very glad to have you here. <clears throat> I want to thank you for taking uh, time for God this weekend, uh, this morning. In a little bit, we're going to be uh, answering um, 
a question on uh, how we can really support each other in hard times. How do we function as a church family? What kind of things do we need to be doing uh, to make sure that we all remain uh, firm and, uh, and strong in our faith? So we hope you'll stick around for that here in just a little bit. Uh, we would love to hear from you today. Uh, if, you've, uh, if you're on Facebook or YouTube, uh, please make a comment. If you want to be notified of every time we do a trick, uh, make sure that you like us, subscribe us, uh, or uh, give us the thumbs up there. Uh, we'd be honored uh, if you would do that and if you'd be willing to share us with a friend as well. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements about things going on uh, today and later this week. Uh, we're hosting a newcomer's lunch today for anybody who considers themselves new to RCC. Uh, we have a, a tasty lunch planned and would love to have you uh, join us in the Fellowship Hall uh, once we're done this morning. Because it is fall break on the school calendar, there will be no Wednesday night program here. So no potluck, no children's or youth uh, uh, Bible studies this Wednesday. Uh, we will pick up again next week. Um, we do want to remind you that this coming Saturday at 9 a.m. there is a honeydew fall work day. Uh, we could use your help on all kinds of projects. Um, you may say, well, I don't have a lot of great skills. That's okay. You don't need them. Um, we, we have people who can do uh, lots of incredible things. Um, there are some of the rest of us who just vacuum. So uh, come and help us out. Uh, with dusting, vacuuming, um, putting up, changing banners, those kind of things. We'd love to have your help Saturday at 9. Uh, and I have a promise of a few um, home-baked treats as well for anybody who comes. Uh, and then in, in a couple Sundays, October the 31st, uh, it is going to be a, another fun full day. We're going to have a chili cook-off after church, so you should plan to um, to eat lunch here on, on Halloween. Um, there's a sign-up sheet if you'd like to be in um, in the cook-off for valuable prizes, um, a great deal of fame and notoriety. Um, there's a giant trophy out there that you'll get to hold for a minute um, if you win based on popular opinion, but you're all welcome to come. Bring whatever you'd like, um, whatever you think goes with chili. Uh, personally, I think that's peanut butter and honey sandwiches, so you can do whatever you'd like. Um, and then from 2 to 3 o'clock, we're having a trunk or treat here in the church parking lot. We really do need lots of trunks and lots of treats um, so that our neighborhood kids know that we love them um, and that we're here for them. So uh, there are sign-up sheets for that over at the, uh, the children's welcome desk. Hope you'll get that taken care of today. And if you don't want a trunk or treat, but you got big bags full of candy, boxes and barrels full, by all means, bring it here and we'll hand it out for you. Okay, uh, in the bulletin, um, there are lots of things that are listed, um, several, uh, several more announcements than we typically do, um, some of which we've already talked about. Uh, the, um, the prayer uh, list has gotten bumped to the back. There's enough things going on. So please pay attention to this. Uh, make sure you know what's, uh, what's coming up uh, in the next several days. <clears throat> Uh, I did mention our prayer chain. Uh, if you have prayer requests, uh, we have a prayer chain of 118 people that have promised to stop and pray for your, uh, your praise or your request. Um, you can submit that at uh, prayer at roychristian.org. Um, there's a link on the website, uh, or you can give me a call, and we'll make sure that it gets on there. Um, as, as I said, there is a summary uh, let me just uh, hit uh, a few of them quickly. Uh, some of you would remember Felicia Gould. Uh, her pa father passed away this last week. Uh, he's been a wheelchair uh, bound for quite some time. Uh, so if we pray for Felicia, uh, for all of uh, the Sacco family uh, and um, uh, during this difficult time. Steve Turbin is, uh, is, is here somewhere. Um, I can't see him. I have, oh, there he is. I have the, my reading glasses, not my far glasses. So uh, Steve had a trip to the hospital this week that was totally inconclusive. Uh, he was home by the evening. Uh, you, most of you are aware that Tim Rohde had a heart attack this past week. He is still in the hospital in intermediate care. They're trying to get his blood pressure balanced. Uh, and then Gene Hellyer has also been in the hospital this past week for 
pneumonia from COVID. Uh, both she and her husband, JR, are really still uh, very sick, um, uh, struggling at home. Uh, Jean asked us also to pray for a co-worker's husband, Kevin. Um, uh, he, he has COVID as well, um, got some treatment, was out, and then uh, is now back in the hospital, last I heard. So uh, I'm, I'm confident there are many other things that you'd like to pray about. Let's take a few moments uh, to pray silently together, and then I'll close. <clears throat> Father, we're grateful for the beautiful morning that you've given to us today to come together for worship. We're grateful for the rain that we have uh, enjoyed this past week. We, we hope to see more of it uh, in the near future. Uh, we thank you for constantly showering us with just what we need, um, just at the right time. Thank you for loving us and for uh, providing for us. Uh, we ask, Father, that as we consider all these friends and family members that we've been praying about this week, uh, we, we pray that, um, that you will hold them uh, in the palms of your very strong hands, that you will take care of them, uh, that you will provide uh, whatever is needed, and Lord, that you would use us as well to be answers to some of our own prayers. Uh, Lord, help us to be um, instruments of your peace, of your care, of your love and grace. Uh, uh, we ask, Father, that... <clears throat> You would uh, take care of each one. There are still so many people who are dealing with COVID um, of some kind or another. Uh, it's such a, a difficult time for everybody. Uh, we've been uh, we've been battling this uh, and hearing about it and thinking about it and being controlled by it for the last year and a half. Uh, and Lord, we are we are weary. Uh, we pray that you would give us the strength that we need uh, to carry on in the right way. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and for uh, providing for us this church family, um, for giving us um, your son, Jesus, as a way uh, to heaven. Thank you for the way. It's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I read this past week um, that there are three kinds of givers. Some givers are like a piece of flint. To get any, anything out of flint, you have to hammer it, and even then you only get chips and sparks. Others are like a sponge. To get anything out of a sponge, you must squeeze it and squeeze it hard because the more you squeeze a sponge, the more you get. But others are like a honeycomb, which just overflows with its own sweetness. That is how God gives to us, and it is how we should give in turn. We appreciate your sweet gifts to God. Uh, to make a gift, you can drop an envelope in the basket out on the foyer table. You can give electronically through our website at roychristian.org, or you can schedule your giving through your financial institution. However you do that, uh, and, and if you did that, we are grateful uh, for your giving, uh, for your worshiping with us today. <clears throat> and that'll bring us to our message this morning. <clears throat> we have been talking um, about... Uh, messages from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the church at Colossae. Um, we don't have uh, a ton uh, in common with those people who lived uh, more than 1,900 years ago in, uh, in Asia Minor and modern-day Turkey, but uh, some of the truth that Paul gives to them is absolutely important for us and applicable to our lives. He focuses in his letter on the faithful devotion of those who have joined themselves to Jesus. The heart of the book uh, seems to be stay on Christ's path no matter what. If anything else comes along, if anything looks different or better, you stay in Jesus. You've been changed by him. You've been transformed by Christ. So remain in him, grow in him, and then live a life of uncompromising change. Don't give up anything for anyone except Jesus. We've been all the way through the first chapter of Colossians, uh, and that means that we're now ready for Colossians chapter 2. 
Uh, if you have your uh, Bible, I'd encourage you to turn there to Colossians 2. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in a chair rack somewhere near you. Uh, you're welcome to keep that one if you'd like. <clears throat> Uh, but let's look for uh, the book of Colossians that's in the New Testament, the second half of the Bible, uh, after things like Galatians, Ephesians, and Philippians, uh, and before First and Second Thessalonians and Timothy. So uh, get, get there in the vicinity of Colossians chapter 2, and let me read um, just a bit. Uh, we're going to go down through uh, verses 1 through 7 of Colossians 2. I want you to know... How hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you now in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you, are, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. <clears throat> when we finished up chapter 1 last week, the, the last verse um, talked about how, uh, how, uh, how strongly, how passionately Paul was laboring for all kinds of believers everywhere. He uses words that describe the kind of struggle that you would have in the athletic arena as you're trying to win a race or some other kind of competition or a contest. Um, a lot of what he is struggling against is not just the difficulty of ministry, although it is not a piece of cake. Mostly what he's struggling against are teachers who have come into this little church and started planting ideas that are not a part of the real truth about who Jesus is and what he does for people. And so he has deep concern. That's what he, uh, what he uh, shows us and, and tells those people. Um, he has great uh, concern for those that he served. And so here in chapter 2, it's the same route. He is, he is uh, contending um, hard for the people in Colossae. It's the same root word as that struggling in the arena. But the question is, if Paul is chained up next to a Roman guard under house arrest someplace far away, if he can't even leave the house, then how is he contending? How is he struggling intensely for them? Well, it seemed to me, based on what we've seen so far in this letter and what, uh, what Paul tells us right here, is that he is struggling for his fellow believers in the, er uh, the arena of prayer. Um, how many of you have said or texted or written in the last, we'll go way back, the last month to somebody, I'll be praying for you or I'll pray for you, Okay. Several, several of us. That is a very easy thing to say, isn't it? I'll be praying for you. I will pray for you. We may even sign up for the prayer chain so we can see what the requests are when they come through. But as the guy who looks at the prayer chain regularly, I know that some of you don't really get around to that very often. Usually less than a third of the prayer requests that go out are actually opened by people on the prayer chain. I don't know how that makes you feel. Mostly it makes me um, a little sad. We like prayer. We believe it is powerful. We don't always take time to do it. Maybe you've experienced that conflict of soul in praying for the people. Well, I, I don't open their prayer chain because I don't know what to say. I don't know how to pray for them once I see what the request is. I tell somebody I'm going to pray for them, then I don't know what to, 
How do I word that? What do I do? Well, I, I think what we can learn from this passage are some of the things that we can say, some, of the, some direction on how we can pray for others. Because praying for others is like the very first punch uh, in this, this paragraph. So far in chapter 1, um, Paul has said that he prays with thanksgiving for those who have accepted the good news about Jesus. He's just grateful to God for the people who hear preaching and respond to it. They believe that Jesus is God's son. He thanks God for them. Uh, he also uh, prays in verses 9 through 10 that, um, that the people there and other believers would be filled with the knowledge of God's will, something that every single human being uh, can do a better job of understanding, so that they can live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way. I don't know what to pray. Well, why don't you pray that their life would make God smile? Why don't you pray that they will, um, they will be filled with more understanding of what God's will is for their life? And then in verse 11, he prays that the believers would be encouraged and strengthened against the error of smooth-talking false preachers. That's something else that we can pray for other people, that they would stand firm, that they would grab a hold of the truth and not let go, regardless of what pretty flashy thing comes along in a little while. Okay, so that's just in chapter 1. There's three things that we can pray about for other believers. In other letters, he prays um, specifically, uh, like in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, he prays that the eyes of their hearts would be enlightened so they may know the hope to which God has called them. Just open their eyes that more and more they would understand God's path. In Ephesians 3, verses 16 and 17, Paul prays that out of God's glorious riches, that he would strengthen them with power through the Holy Spirit and that they, would able, that they would be able to grasp how wide and long and high and deep the love of Christ Jesus is for them. That's a beautiful prayer, isn't it? Something you pray for your spouse, for your children, for your grandchildren, for your neighbors, for your coworkers, that they would see how limitless, how boundless the love of Christ is for them. One more in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, Paul prays that the love of those believers would abound more and more with depth of insight. Not just that they would experience more and more love, but the amount of love in their own lives would grow and grow. Here in Colossians uh, chapter 2, he is praying about their unity in love. Love is the thing that should bring us together. Uh, right now, Captain and Tennille is playing through my head. I wasn't expecting that, but it's right there. Love will keep us together. That's, but it's the truth. Um, the believers can be encouraged to stand together in the unity of love. Some of you people make me crazy. You don't think like I do. You don't live like I do. You have different priorities. You vote the wrong way. You order the wrong way in a restaurant. But I still love you. And I still call you brother and sister. And I want to bring you close, and I want us to all stand together. We don't have to agree about everything under the sun in order for us to be family in Christ Jesus. Paul also prays for the full riches of understanding. Um, if you have an encouraged heart and uh, you have this unity of love, there is going to be new understanding of what the mystery of Jesus is really all about. When we're new, the first few times we hear the truth about who Jesus is, he's God's son, he came as a sacrifice, he gave his life for us because he loves us, he's the way to heaven. We think we understand that, but the more time that we spend with other believers, the more time we spend in his word, the better we understand, we get glimpses deeper, better glimpses of what it's really like, sort of like being a parent. Before you have children, you got it all figured out. You're telling people how they need to raise their kids, right? <laughs> when I'm a parent, I'll never do that. Right. And then you have children. And then you realize you know nothing. 
And every day is a new adventure in trying to understand better and better what it means to be the father or mother of a child, to help bring them up to be a functional human being. It's challenging. And thankfully, we don't have to know it all from the very beginning. We learn as we go. We understand better. Um, I thought that I understood the love of God for his people before I was a husband and a father. But as a husband and a father, I understand his level of love in greatly expanded ways. What he was willing to do for us blows me away based on how I feel about my wife and children. In Jesus, there's wisdom and knowledge, um, not in otherworldly spiritual beings like the false teachers are trying to convince them of, okay? Forget all this other stuff. It's not there. It's not real. Reality is in Jesus. It isn't hidden. It's been revealed. It's a mystery that is open to everybody now. Um, Paul has real concern for these believers. He really desperately, deeply cares about them. It's not clear if he's really met them or not. Chances are, the likelihood is that he's never met these people, but he still has deep passion for their health and their safety as they continue to grow in Christ Jesus. He doesn't want them to be led away by some kind of crazy new teaching. He wants them to remain to rely on Jesus. So when I look at all that, the question that I ask myself is, am I so wrapped up in my own life that I can't see the needs of other believers around me? Paul has this kind of view for all these other believers. Do I have the same kind of concern for my brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus here. I like them. I love them. I want to be around them. But am I constantly praying with thanksgiving, praying for their encouragement, praying for their growth? It's really easy to say, I'm praying for you. But it's a lot harder to do. The other big idea that I think we see in this passage um, is that we shouldn't just be praying for each other, but we need to be cheering each other on. We need to cheer each other on. Um, In the word encourage in verse 2 means in the original language that you would call somebody alongside you. Um, I think it's kind of interesting this morning that um, as I was thinking about this passage, I thought back to... Um, a coach from high school, and this morning, one of my good friends from high school is actually here. So he'll go, oh yeah, I remember him well. Uh, we had a football coach who, um, for, for two years of my f- high school football career caused me to believe that I was the most worthless piece of not human flesh that ever existed. There was a lot of hollering and screaming and swearing and spit flying in face masks. Um, that is not how I respond. I, I, got, I felt worse and worse, and I knew less and less about what I was supposed to do. The way to get me to understand something is to say, James, me, come over here. Put your arm around me. We walk slowly. We talk quietly. We go through all the nuances of like, Now, now I get it. Now I am encouraged and equipped to do the thing that I've been asked to do. Way too often Christians have this this persona that they just want to get everybody up close and then beat them over the head with the Bible. You're screwing your life up. Stop messing around. You need to straighten up and fly right. What's wrong with you anyway, heathen, pagan, jerk? When we look in the New Testament, The best kinds of change, the best kinds of transformation happen when somebody is called alongside, encouraged to remain true to Jesus. I think Paul lays out four really critical areas for us where we need to be urging and encouraging fellow believers. 
And uh, the first one is to, re- to be rooted in him. Um, I know you don't care about this, but all four things are participles. It's something that just goes on. It's the same thing you continue in. It's not that you start doing. You just continue to live being rooted in Christ Jesus. He has already said that they were planted in Christ early on when they believed. They were planted in Jesus. They accepted the, the gospel message. And so now they are in him. Well, we talked last week about abiding, remaining, taking up residence in him. So the encouragement is don't get transplanted into something else. When we see people veering off the path, we need to encourage them to return to their roots. There is nothing that is sadder to me as a pastor than to see somebody who comes, um, they're very interested in, uh, in faith, they're interested in Christian uh, spirituality, and they take a few first steps, and then poof, they're gone. And we find out later that they, they either stopped going to church altogether, or they have joined some other group that teaches really wildly different things than we do. We dropped it all to follow ancient Norse mythology. That, that kind of kills because we've got truth here. And I don't know if it's, if it's their decision or my failure or some combination of the two that has not allowed them to remain um, in that right path. We need to encourage people to come back to the roots that they have found in Jesus. We also need to cheer people uh, on to continue to live being built up in him. Okay, We're rooted, but we also got to be built up. Being constructed in Christ is a never-ending process. Nobody has ever done. We, may, we might make big jumps, some huge progress in leaps and bounds, but we are always being built. There's always baby steps that we're taking. We need to continue to find ways to build ourselves up in Christ Jesus. And also, because we're worried about encouraging others, when we see other believers who really are, are struggling to live up to the progress that they've made, we need to invite them to come alongside us, to come along with us. Join us in a study of the Bible. Work beside us in some kind of service. Sit with us in a a worship service. We need to make sure that we're being built up and that we're helping other people being built up in Jesus as well. We also need to continue to live being strengthened in the faith. Sort of like being built, um, we're not finished being made stronger. Daily life drains our resources, right? Right? We get to the end of the day and just think, I'm glad it's over because I got nothing left. We are broken and spilled out. We need to find time to recharge our batteries. Not just in an annual group retreat or going to a big conference somewhere, but we need to find daily times of worshiping and resting in God. That's how we're recharged. We read his word. We listen to good teaching and preaching on the radio. Um, we, we sing along with, with praise and worship songs on the radio or um, through some device. Uh, we, we see things that are encouraging to our spirit and soul. We get stronger. We want to bring in healthy things. But also, we need to keep an eye out for others around us. When we see people fading, like as they're running their race, they get slower and slower and they kind of fade way back and sit down and stop. We need to, we need to reach out uh, and, and to, to come alongside them. We need to, at a minimum, send them a card. I'm thinking about you. I've been missing you. How can I, how can I pray for you? What can I do to help you? Invite them to go to lunch. Um, sit down and pray with them about whatever it is that's going on in their lives. Not just a pastor, not just an elder can pray for somebody who's in a crisis. You can too. 
We need to be strengthened in faith and help others to be strengthened in their faith. And the last thing that Paul talks about in this passage is that uh, we need to be continually overflowing with thankfulness. Um, the word picture is of a river that is overflowing its banks. Uh, is, it is unbounded. It is limitless. It just keeps spreading and spreading. A continual, habitual flow of thankfulness to God. In all of his letters, Paul talks over and over again about his gratitude for what God has done, for what he has received um, from Christ uh, and the Holy Spirit. Our gratitude really is a form of worship. Um, my favorite definition of worship is a response to what God has done for us. It could be a song. It could be a painting. It could be a dance. It could be any number of things. But gratitude is how we respond to God's gifts to us. Grateful people are great people. Can other people see your, your attitude of gratitude? Can they see how richly you've been blessed? Do they understand how you understand where those blessings have come from? Are there others who are encouraged to thank God by the example that you're setting? Have you stopped whining and complaining long enough because you now have an awareness of God's blessing and provision? Just this last week, the preacher was grumbling under his breath in his mind when nobody else was at home out loud, grousing about the way that things were. This, is, this stinks. This is not fair. And then I realized that I was not in the hospital having a heart attack. I was not stranded at home with COVID. I had not lost a loved one. Blessed beyond measure. And so everything changed in that moment. Much more grateful, much more satisfied. And, and hopefully the people around me could see that change. In, in these verses, Paul really just challenges the people who believe in Jesus to keep moving to never stop making progress, to do some reflection. So let me irritate you this morning. How long has it been since you did some personal spiritual reflection? When was the last time that you did inventory on your soul and spirit? Well, how am I doing? Well, I've been angry for the last six months. Why am I so angry? Why am I so afraid? Why don't I trust God to take care of this? When was the last time I take some time to figure out if you have been moving forward in your relationship with Jesus, which allows you to move forward in your other relationships? Are you pushing ahead? Are you staying encouraged? Or have you stalled? Here's another irritating question. You're welcome. Are you concerned for other believers? As you look around your church family, as you read through the directory, you see the prayer requests, or you see the newsletter, are, are you laboring strenuously, like Paul said he was, to bring others along with you on your journey of faith? Or is it just you and Jesus? Because if it's just you and Jesus, you're living a kind of faith that is not found in the New Testament. It's not in the Bible. It's always... Jesus and me and all y'all, if you're from the South. It's all of us. It is so easy for us. I'm praying for you. It's really easy to say we're encouraging and bringing up people along. Oh, I just love my church family. It is much more difficult to actually carry those things out, to, to do the very hard work of being a part of the church. But that is exactly what we're called to. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we know that you have put us into a church family for a reason. You surround us with other believers who are all headed in the same direction. And we ask, Father, that you would continue to, to push us, 
to drag us, to motivate us, to continue to grow together. Lord, we pray that uh, when we see our brothers and sisters in Christ in need, that we will stop what we're doing and that we will pray. It doesn't take long, just a, a moment, to pray about the real needs that we see and hear about. Lord, we don't want to be liars. We don't, we don't want to be hypocrites. We don't want to say that we're going to pray and then not do it. So, Lord, kick us. Lord, we also know that um, so much of the world is discouraging and full of despair and hopelessness and depression, even among people who have faith in Christ. So, Lord, we pray that you would help us to bring people along, to see where people are, to go to their side, and to walk with them, to lead them into their life-changing connection with you. Father, we're grateful for the promise that your Holy Spirit is with us at all times, that he is pushing and whispering and leading and protecting us, reminding us. We ask that you would, uh, you would ramp up his work in our lives, that we would open our ears and our hearts so we can hear him. Thank you, Father, for what you do for us through Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> We celebrate the Lord's Supper, communion, or the Eucharist, every Sunday. Um, so if I could have four, uh, four men to come and to begin serving the congregation, uh, uh, they'll pass out the bread and the juice uh, to everyone. If you're watching from home, if you would please have your bread and grape juice ready, we'll all partake together in just a moment. I probably don't have to tell you this, but I will remind you of it. Thank you. That, that Jesus was a Jew. He was the Jewish Messiah. His 12 disciples were all Jewish. When Jews worshipped, they did so on the Sabbath, set out for them in the Ten Commandments. They, the Sabbath is on Saturday. After the resurrection of Jesus, though, Christian worship occurred on Sunday to commemorate his victory over death. In Acts chapter 20, verse 7, <clears throat> Luke reports that on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread, the Lord's Supper. Christian worship centered on the Lord's Supper, a meal that believers observed every time they met in order to remember the Lord, to sense his presence, his forgiveness, and his love. Jesus is central for all Christians. Think about what a, a significant shift that is for all of these men, all of these women who are believers in Jesus, all Jewish believers in Jesus, to make the major transition from Saturday to Sunday. Not the last day of the week, but the first day of the week. That's a, a significant shift for all the rest of time. Let's pray. Father, <clears throat> at the table, we think about Jesus' perfect life. We're reminded of our own failures and imperfections. But in Jesus, we see a glimpse of the person that we might become. Father, as these elements feed us today, may your Holy Spirit fill us so that the world may know that we have been in the presence of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. This is the Lord's table. Everybody who considers themselves a Christian is, uh, is invited to partake in this meal. We read the words that Matthew recorded in, um, in his gospel, the account of the Last Supper. Matthew writes there, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. <clears throat> then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> 
uh, in the last um, several weeks, there have been a handful of people who have made um, what I think is probably the most important decision in their lives. Not what their job is or who they will marry, although those are both very important, but what's going to happen with the rest of their life? What happens after death? Dawn and Sue have both joined themselves to Jesus forever. Uh, and um, this morning, uh, there's uh, one more, um, one more lady who has come uh, saying that she is ready to make that same commitment to, um, to, to join her life to Jesus um, and uh, to be baptized in him. So Jane, uh, why don't you come on up here? <clears throat> if you haven't met Jane yet, it's because she's hiding. She loves attention. She loves to be the center of focus. Um, and so she, she just kind of sneaks in and sneaks out. But some of you have had the chance to get to know her. Um, she's been going to, um, to a small group on Monday nights. And um, we've had a chance to visit just a little bit um, back at the park. Um, she indicated that she was ready to take the next step. So we've, we've visited some more. And Jane uh, is ready to take the next really big step. Um, let me ask you, Jane, do you believe that Jesus is God's son? And do you want him to be your Lord, Savior, Master, Rescuer? Can you repeat after me? Okay. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, my Lord and my Savior. Okay. We're going to go to the back and get ready for baptism. Um, but before we go, um, if you are here this morning and you are willing to pray, remember what the preacher just said about this. If you're willing to pray for Jane over the next 40 days, every time she crosses your brain, <clears throat> which I hope is every day, if you're willing to pray for her as she begins her life with Jesus, will you raise your hand? All right. I'm going to ask you. Okay, uh, so we're going to go to the back. I think Al is going to come and talk for a minute about a couple things, uh, but we'll see you in just a few moments. Good morning. Uh, as a lot of you know, and some don't, that October is set aside as Pastor Appreciation Month. Uh, I was wanting to make this announcement last week, but I uh, went home to visit with my dad, and uh, so in, um, for pa Pastor Appreciation, we have James and we have Jen. Although Jen is not a ordained preacher, she is the one that introduces Christ to all of our little kids. She's the one that sets the stage for uh, what they learn and what they get to know. Um, and it's not just James and Jen that's involved. It's both of their families. They take and they spend time preparing for things, doing things, and missing out on things because either James or Jen isn't there. They're doing other things. Uh, at our... Meeting, uh, James said, you know, the thing he wants most is a potluck. He said, that's the thing he misses the most in the last year and a half because of COVID. And then uh, the question came up, uh, what kind of dumplings do you like in your chicken dumplings? The big, plump, dough ball ones or the, you know, thin, wide, ones that my, were in my granny's chicken dumplings that we always look forward to at our holiday meals. So uh, we're going to have a potluck on the 24th of October at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, I'm sure a couple pots of chicken dumplings wouldn't be, uh, you know, refused, but uh, it's a potluck, so bring anything. Uh, also, if... Uh, you know, if you want to take and give them a card showing your appreciation, a gift, or just an act of kindness, I know that would be very much appreciated. Thank you. <clears throat> 